Thank you, David. That was wonderful. Um, our next speaker comes to us from California. Um, he's in California, and this is the first time the Frick has ever done a live video feed, so bear with us. It's very exciting. Um, it will be Dr. Doug Eck. Um, he is a research scientist at Google, working in the areas of music, art, and machine learning. Currently, he is leading the Magenta Project, a Google Brain effort to generate music, video, images, and text using deep learning and reinforcement learning. Doug worked in areas such as rhythm and meter perception, aspects of music performance, machine learning for large audio data sets, and music recommendation for Google Play Music. He completed his PhD in computer science and cognitive science at Indiana University in 2000 and went on to a postdoctoral fellowship with Jürgen Schmidhuber at IDSIA in Lugano, Switzerland. Before joining Google in 2010, Doug worked in computer science at the University of Montreal, where he became associate professor. Are we ready for Doug? OK. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Doug. And thank you for letting me speak to you from uh, so far away, sunny California. Um, I'd like to thank Emily Spratt for inviting me. And uh, I hope that um, the talk that I'm going to give you now will, will be an, taking us in a, in, a, in a different direction from the previous two talks, which were both fascinating. Um, I think you're going to hear um, some similar talks coming later from John Smith at IBM and also Christoph Linnell. So some more talks about machine learning, deep learning. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of AI and machine learning in creating art and in creating music and talk less about um, analyzing art. And I, I invite you to put on a different hat for, the, for a moment to think a little bit more about what it's like to be a creator. And um, let's, let's discuss whether or not we might find uh, neural networks and, and deep learning to be of, of any use in this endeavor. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to this with an open mind. I'm, I'm not 100% convinced there is a role for AI and machine learning in, in art creation and music creation. But I think the evidence is there that uh, certainly very suggestive that we may be able to use these tools um, to, to make something fun and useful. So um, the first thing I want to point to is this great animation of a neural network. And you're going to hear a little bit more technical uh, uh, description of this later, so I'm going to save my time and just point out that um, fundamentally what we're doing is uh, looking at some information in the world, in this case the pixels from an image, and we are trying to make some decision about that, uh, that, that data or trying to transform that data in some way. Um, the white lines that you see are weighted connections, um, and the dots that you see, black and white, are what we call neurons as an analogy to the brain. And fundamentally, the game with deep learning is to set those weighted connections in such a way that we transform data in a, in a way that's meaningful for us. In this case, the transformation that we're doing is about classification. Is that a cat or a dog? Um, but we can also do transformations that are useful for generation, and we'll come, we'll come back to that in a minute. By the way, that is a dog. Um, I have a hard time with that myself. So. Um, so the place where most people start in thinking about the role of neural networks in, in art is in looking at ways in which we can transform pixels. And so this started off with uh, works like Deep Dream, that, where we visualized what uh, certain nodes or layers in neural networks to learn. Um, there are some people doing great work in this space. I really wanted to point out the work of Mario Klingemann who uh, has a great Twitter following. I highly recommend you check out his Twitter feed uh, at Quasimondo. Um, here's just one of his recent experiments where he is looking at the kinds of distortions that different layers and neural networks make on an image. In some ways, he says analogy to, to dementia, um, a fun analogy. But he's, he's very playful. He's doing a bunch of great work with generative models that are generating new images. and. Uh, and uh, I think this is one really cool direction. I'm actually not going to focus on that direction of work. Um, one reason I'm not going to focus on it is that I think if there's anything that likely this crowd knows about is this work that has to do with looking at pixels and generating pixels. Um, instead, I'm going to move to a much higher level of talking about machine learning and talk about different ways to represent the world and different ways to, to make predictions about the world. So effectively, we're going to leave pixels behind, at least on the generative side, and look more at, um, at uh, uh, different kinds of sequences. The, the first sequence I'd like to, to mention is, is language. Okay? I know this is uh, about the visual arts in this room, but I think it's illustrative to think about where we are with machine learning and language. And probably the best place to start is with translation. 
So um, here's a, a graphic of how our current um, translation works at Google. I suspect many of you have translated something using Google Translate. It's one of the more popular translation engines. And uh, right now, the system that we have actually is able to work across languages. So it's seeing um, uh, sentences and paragraphs. I might call them strings using a technical term in English and translate into Korean. Um, it might be looking at Japanese and translating to English. Um, and in fact, it's learning ways to translate between language pairs that it's never seen before, which is kind of cool. It's like the model learns lingua franca. So what does that have to do with art? Okay, so everything I'm telling you now is suggestive, but um, I want to take a look at a minute at the um, this old translation versus this new translation at the bottom of, of a paragraph. This is uh, thanks to a great article in the New York Times from last year. Um, let's look at the last sentence of the old translation of um, a paragraph from uh, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Whether the leopard had what the demand at that altitude, there is no that nobody explained. Okay, I think you get the gist. There's definitely some information there. We haven't lost everything. Other sentences show you that there's some information retained. The top close to the west, there is a dry frozen carcass of a leopard. But now let's look at what happens with end-to-end -end, uh, neural network trained uh, translation. So the bottom is coming from the system I showed you on the previous slide where we're taking a sentence in one language pushing it into a very large neural network and then trying to generate the translated sentence. Now the last line is, no one can explain what leopard was seeking at that altitude. And the sentence before, there is a dried and frozen carcass of leopard near the summit of the West. So the models are doing a much better job of retaining the original message, the original intent of the author. Now, this isn't art, right? This isn't anything but translation but be thinking about how systems like these might give us a kind of expressivity or flexibility that we didn't have before and how some clever artists or musicians might come along and do something with this, or writers in this case. Um, I'd also point out that um, there's also kind of a utility factor here at play. Um, I don't know, some of you in the room, you know, I can't do a show of hands because I can't see you all and I can't listen because of the delay, but um, some of you probably have seen Smart Reply. 12% um, of all responses sent on mobile have been sent with machine learning uh, based suggestions. They're short. They're things like no plans yet. I'll be right there. I can't make it. Okay. And that's actually a, a, a canned list of phrases that the models are choosing, uh, finding most relevant. But we may find ourselves in a world where um, the kinds of more flexible and more um, uh, expressive models, like very large neural networks, might give us a chance where AI is actually helping us communicate. Um, helping complete our messages, helping us communicate in ways that we couldn't communicate um, without that AI. And this is where I started thinking about this problem, started thinking about Magenta, um, this project that I'm running that is um, trying to do open source work in the space of generative models for art and music. Um, these are my kids, Sam and Olivia, and they're in Japan, and this was last year. And one thing I want you to note from this photograph is that, you know, they're pretty glued to their phones. Um, having some ramen, there's the phone. Waiting for train tickets, there's the phone. And at one level, um, we can all look at this as a hindrance. And those of you who are parents in the audience certainly can resonate with the, the fear that we have. is like, oh my God, my kids are being eaten alive by their devices. But I also see here an opportunity. Um, I've watched how my kids have used relatively simple apps like Snapchat and Instagram. And they've kind of built their own grammar around them. They've, they've built their own way of communicating around them. If there's a way to use Snapchat that's the right way, and it, there's a way to use Snapchat that's the wrong way. And my kids know how to do it, and I don't, and that's part of the game too. But the point I want you to see is that there's a kind of, always a kind of regeneration and transformation that takes place when, when people like my kids come to technology and have a new tool to work with. And if there's any expressivity in it, they're, they're going to find it, okay? And that's the, the lens with which I'm, I'm looking at the work that we're doing here. So I wanna to talk to you about a couple of projects um, that have to do with art generation. And I particularly love showing off this work to people who really do art because I'm totally accepting of the fact that you're all gonna shrug your shoulders and say, what is this? This is garbage. What is this? This isn't interesting at all. I think the interest comes maybe um, in, in, the, in the expressivity, in the playfulness, and in how it points to where we might be with another 10 years of work in this space. And the space that I'm talking about is the space of using generative models, models that can generate something new based upon the data on which they're trained. And the first um, project I want to talk about is called SketchRNN. The, uh, the first author on this project's name is David Ha. 
He works at Google Brain with me and others. And uh, he's also got a really interesting Twitter following. I highly recommend looking at Hard Maru, uh, his, Twitter, his Twitter handle. And what we're going to look at are um, uh, machine learning models that are trained on drawings done by people. You'll see some of those drawings on the left over there, the little um, sketches. They were done in a game called Quick Draw, which is a, was meant as a Google fun game where you're playing Pictionary against the, um, against the computer, actually against an AI model. And um, we were able to collect billions of these drawings and train on them. And crucially, um, those drawings, we, we were able to preserve the, um, the stroke order. So we're not seeing pixels. Very crucially, we're seeing drawings. And these drawings are being represented for the neural network that we're going to train as delta x, delta y positions. So where did the pen move? Where was the pen and where did it move? And then we also have a representation that tells us when was the pen lifted up and when was it put down. And one thing that we'll see here is that this representation gives rise to very different behavior when we start to generate than we see um, when training on pixels, on the actual pixel values in the image. So let's do a little bit of machine learning. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take those delta x, delta y um, values. There's a cat on the left, very nice cat. And uh, we're going to do something called encoding. We're going to encode that cat um, into the neural network. And by encoding, I mean we're going to try to learn an appropriate representation of that sequence of strokes such that if you look to the right, we can later decode it with another neural network and recreate our drawing. So if you think of it this way, the left and the right images, the cats, are living in the space of delta x, delta y positions. They are drawings and we can animate them and we can look at them. Um, there's something we can make sense of. If you look in the, at the yellow box in the middle, that is, in some sense, a representation of that drawing that is optimal for recreating it. So it is a vector, so it's a sequence of numbers, and it is, its job is to represent this drawing. It doesn't look anything like the drawing. If you look at the numbers, it's not going to make sense to you. But it makes sense to the decoder in terms of being able to regenerate the sketch, and it makes sense to the encoder in terms of being able to generate the latent representation. Okay, and. Uh, What's interesting is if we, if we train these models correctly, that latent representation, that vector in the yellow box can give rise to some very nice behavior. Um, the first behavior that I want to point out, on the left, what you see are uh, dozens of generated yoga poses. And those came from training that model just on drawings by people of yoga. And what I want you to see is that there's actually a lot of variety in these poses. And these poses are generated by um, I should back up a bit, sorry. I'm gonna back up a slide. These poses are generated by running a random number generator and generating a random latent vector. That is generating a random vector in the yellow box and then decoding it. And if we train appropriately, we can generate random yoga poses that look to our eyes like real yoga poses and we can animate the sketches and they would look like they were sketched. Um, also, um, if we look on the right hand side, you'll see a bunch of faces these were generated in a very different way. They're not randomly generated. Rather, each of the four corners is a human drawn face that is purposely drawn to look different from the other faces. So in the upper left, you see kind of a potato or pear shaped face. On the upper right, you see a round face. On the uh, going clockwise, on the lower right, you see a square face. And on the lower left, you see a triangular face. Now, those are all encoded into the network and we get their yellow box latent representations. And now we just move in a straight line. We move literally um, from all four corners into the middle and populate with faces. And what you see is we're able to get this kind of smoothly changing behavior. We're able to see what, what, it, what, what lives between that triangular face that I drew and that square face that I drew. Does it make sense? Is it another face that looks good to me? And so it, though I grant these are toy drawings, they're just little sketches, we get this idea of being able to explore a space and to kind of fill in the missing parts where, where we weren't able to take the time or didn't have the knowledge to draw ourselves. At the bottom, we really see this clearly in going from, uh, on the left is a human drawn cat, and on the right is a human drawn, I don't know, is it a pig? I guess it's a pig, it's got a curly tail. And we can see how the model moves smoothly, kind of retaining the forward looking face until we get to the middle and finally flipping and saying we're in profile now, and then moving from cat over to pig. So. I don't expect you to be blown away. I don't expect applause, but I want you to appreciate that we actually have a rather expressive model here that gives us the chance to sample and kind of cover the space of possibilities, as you see on the left, 
and also is smooth in a way that's very useful. We can move around that space in a useful way. And so this gives us the, the chance to build some simple but fun tools for creation. Um, on the left, you'll see the beginning of a drawing. Remember, these drawings are stored as sketches, so we can start them because we know where the people started their drawings. We start drawing, and then we ask the model to fill in. Uh, the top is garden. The model's filled in some, some gardens based on what we've done. The second one down is the face model, and we've just drawn the beginning of a face, and then we let the model fill in different faces based on that. So in some very simple way, it's completing our thoughts. Um, we move down, we have owl, we have mosquito, and we have fire truck. And so this is a direction we can go in in terms of kind of enabling artists to just start with something and then let, let the machine kind of fill in. I think it's also sometimes surprising to see how well this captures human behavior. Um, almost every time, if you start by drawing a cloud in the rain model, the, the model will almost always add raindrops. Yet, if you start with raindrops, the model almost never adds clouds. And the idea is that when people drew these, the kind of normal bias is that a person would draw the cloud first and then add the rain. And so we're seeing that the, the model picked up on that same, that same behavior, which, again, is playful and I think kind of cool. Um, finally, and I think maybe most importantly, the, these, these models don't memorize. Okay, that The yellow box that was in that um, first graph that I showed you with the, the, the orange encoder and the orange decoder, that yellow box in the middle, the vector, the latent vector, is purposely made to be uh, too small to actually memorize these drawings. If you make it big enough to memorize the drawings, then it turns kind of into a database, which is boring. It just memorizes drawings. Now, what we want these models to do is to, in some sense, pull out what's important in, in, these, uh, in these drawings. And by important, I mean what are the shared decisions that are made across these drawings that would allow a model to generalize. And so if you look on the left, what you see is um, human drawings in brown, and then the reconstruction um, that's you know, pushing them through the encoder, making the latent representation and decoding them. And what you see is the representations aren't perfect, right? They're, they're close, but they're not perfect. Um, and I think sometimes when they're close but not perfect, you get interesting results. So look carefully at the cat, uh, the third cat down. Um, it's got um, only five whiskers on the left, yet when it's reconstructed, the model reconstructs it with six whiskers. Why? I think it's because the model usually sees six whiskered cats. And so it hasn't an appropriate representation to be able to store and reproduce a five whiskered cat. Um, on the right hand side, we see some drawings that are a little bit less normal. So we see an eight legged pig without eyes gets decoded as a four legged pig with eyes. That's maybe kind of boring. But then let's look at how we can take advantage of that transformation for um, interesting purposes. Here's a truck. And that truck has been treated as passed through the pig model. So the encoder and decoder it was passed through are trying to learn how to make pigs. And what does it do? It turns that truck into, I guess I only would call it a pig truck. Like it's got a little tail and it's kind of pig shaped. And if you know that seems um, like it's not cool, consider how hard it, like, in your own mind, like try to draw a pig truck. I, I, I can't draw a pig truck and, and this can. So, um, so I want you to take away these ideas, um, the core kind of machine learning ideas from this kind of generative model is the ability to find what's important in data, the ability to help complete your thoughts, to sample a wide uh, variety of drawings, and to somehow offer users or artists the chance to play around with them. Okay. Now, let's move on to uh, second idea, phase two here. Um, same drawings, but we're going to talk about uh, a different model. Um, it looks like my, because of how the slide was formatted, my title got wrapped around I apologies. Uh, it should say better drawings via user feedback. And what we have here is a second bit of research. By the way, this is all published research in peer-reviewed uh, journals and, and uh, conferences. And it's all up on our, um, our uh, website at g.co slash magenta. I'll come to that at the end of the talk. But we asked ourselves the question um, for, this, for this work, how do we know whether a drawing is good, A, and B, how can we improve based upon that knowledge? And this is very preliminary work done by, um, the lead on this is Natasha Jakes. She's a PhD student at MIT uh, Media Lab working on effective computation. That is trying to use AI to help, help us be healthier, help us be happier. Um, and uh, she did two internships with us at Google. And the other authors are all Google people, except for Rosalind Picard. She's actually Natasha's uh, uh, advisor at MIT Media Lab. And the goal here was to say, can we improve 
drawings based upon some feedback from users. And so we built up an experimental app and we, you know, when you played with this app, you knew what was going on. Like there was a screen that said what's going on. It looks at your face and it uses a face detector and motion detector to tell whether you're smiling or not. And it pays attention to the images that you see. And you're seeing a bunch of images generated by sketch RNM. And sometimes you find them funny, you laugh at them or you smile at them and sometimes you don't. And so based upon that, we kind of get an idea of what kinds of drawings people find humorous and what kinds of drawings people don't. And then um, we do some machine learning and, and how that works is a little bit out of scope for this talk, but you can read the paper. And so what we do is we say, okay, can we draw cats that are more likely to make people smile? And if you look at the top row A, those are all cats that are randomly drawn from the model. They're just random cats. And if you look at B, these are the cats that the model thinks will make you smile. And what you can see is you get much rounder cats, mostly forward facing cats, big whiskers, big eyes. You can, it's up to you to decide how important this is. Uh, on the bottom, you get much more consistent crabs, kind of smaller crabs. Um, I'm not here saying that like these cat faces are important. I do believe it's really important to be able to close the loop and to understand what people like and what they don't like. And to actually that, like, that empowers the user, that empowers the user to like help steer the AI in a direction that's actually a direction they want, not just the direction perhaps the artist wants or the direction the data suggests. So I think this is exciting, extremely preliminary work. Okay, now I'm gonna shift gears completely and move to, um, I'm seeing a delay in the slide shifting is probably because there's a video loading. Um, I'm going to wait for my slide to load. Let's see what happens here. I'm going to turn up the volume a little bit. Any idea why this slide is not loading? There it goes. OK, I see it on screen, too. Now, we're doing very similar work in the space of music. And in this case, we're treating music as a sequence of numbers, um, like a MIDI file. And what we're trying to do is allow um, for someone to kind of complete the beginning of a drum pattern here. So you as a user can set the red uh, drum beats you want, and then the magenta model will, will kind of fill in for you with the best guess that it has, having been trained on lots and lots of drumming. So let's see if we can, um, if we can make this work. Let's see if you're gonna hear that, yeah, maybe. So you're gonna see us moving around some things and uh, adding some, some beats and subtracting them, and then Finally, we're going to arrive at some rhythm we like, and we're going to generate, and then we're going to listen to it. And you guys can hear it. Okay, cool. Here's another version. So what I like about this, um, what I like about this work is that it allows you as a musician to add and subtract as you like. Um, you can start with as complex a pattern as you want and the AI will try to fill in what you have or you can start with something simple and play around. And that you're, you're fundamentally in control. You have control of tempo and you have control of a number of other variables um, that um, we hope will give you something you like. I'll come back to this in a, a bit later. Um, I wanna shift it finally with a little bit of time I have left to one last project. Um, again, I'm trying to stick to like one or two core machine learning ideas. Um, and I think the main one is this idea of um, learning a new representation of data that allows you to recreate it. But that new representation, it was the yellow box before and now it's these funny lines, um, actually allows you to be expressive in a way that, that, that's hard to do in the space of, 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 of data itself. In this case, I want to talk about NSYNC, which is um, trying to generate, it's basically a, a neural synthesizer, a music synthesizer and it's trained to generate new kinds of sounds that can be played um, musically. So it sees a recorded musical note and as audio, as the actual waveform, and it tries to learn a way to reproduce it. And in doing so, it learns an, an internal representation of, of musical notes that, that we can use later to generalize. And so if you play with this online, which I don't have time to do right now, you can, for example, start with a flute on one side and a bass guitar on the other and kind of move smoothly from flute to bass guitar, which doesn't really make sense in, in audio. You just kind of get the mixture of the two sounds. So what we found was that having this neural synthesizer sitting around um, wasn't that useful, right? So you have these models that can generate, but you don't really have any way for artists to use these models. And this has been a, a big theme for us in Magenta. We started out thinking that the thing that artists wanted to do is copy and paste huge command lines 
from our website into some terminal on their Mac. And it's not what people want to do. What people want to do is actually have tools that work with them on their terms. And so what we did with a group in London called Creative Labs, also part of Google, is we actually designed a hardware synthesizer around this model. And so it is. it has a touch screen, and you can move into the four corners in a way that's very similar to those faces that I showed you, where you have a, 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 a face in each corner that's where you want to start. Remember, it was like a square face and a pear-shaped face. And then we fill in the rest, and you can play around in that space. And it's actually a device that you can carry around with you and play with. Furthermore, we moved this into open source. So you, those of you that are able to play around as makers, maybe you have access to a 3D printer, you can actually fab these things. You can build them and, and make your own. And um, we've had lots of people playing around with them, um, trying to build them, and had some really cool um, interactions with artists that have found this tool to be, to be, to be of use to them. So I want to take a minute just to show you a few seconds of an artist playing around with NSynth Super. I don't know if that audio worked. I couldn't hear it. But I'm just going to keep moving in the interest of time. These are all available online. So I want to close, finally, oddly enough, for a, a visual art group. I want to close actually talking about generative models for text. And because I think you can learn a lot about what machine learning is up to by looking at language. Language is just so hard. And, and what this is is from a very recent paper trying to summarize uh, Wikipedia. So we have access to Wikipedia. Everybody does, actually. You can, you can go access Wikipedia yourself. We try to train models to summarize and learn to write Wikipedia articles. And uh, almost, almost no one has, no, no one really has managed to use machine learning based AI models to write long documents because it's so hard. It's so hard to carry uh, ideas over many, many uh, sentences and paragraphs and have any kind of coherence. And um, we've recently been working with very large neural networks uh, based upon what's called attention, where the model learns to pay attention to certain words that came before and, and use them to their advantage and have some results that outperform the previous state of the art, uh, which was something called a recurrent neural network, in generating text. The cool thing here is, um, I guess the take home is, what you're reading right now was generated by a neural network with nothing but the seed, the transformer, and actually generated our Japanese punk rock band. So all of this is the equivalent of kind of deep dream and language for a neural network. And so what's remarkable about this is that it is even a little bit coherent, right? There's no structure and there's no message to be had. It's just the model dreaming. But still, it sounds somehow coherent, like it could mean something. The early years of the Transformer, the band was formed in 1968 during the height of Japanese music history. Among the legendary Japanese composers of Japanese lyric, they prominently exemplified Motohiro Oda's especially tasty lyrics and psychedelic intention. Okay. And this goes on. I think this is possible with what we had two or three years ago. Now, I'm, what I'm showing you now came uh, about eight paragraphs later, eight paragraphs later in this generated document. And we're still talking about this Japanese band that in 1981 to 2010, the band broke away. On January 1st, 1981, the bassist uh, Michiho Kono and the members of the original lineup emerged. Niji Fukane and his headband, now guitarist, okay, it gets a little bit gibberishy, but we still have this document that's talking end to end about, um, about the same idea. And so if we take that and factor in this idea that we're getting closer to being able to make sense of long-term structure, in this case, the long-term structure in a Wikipedia document, that we're, that we're learning to have machine learning models that can be controlled by users, that build reasonably useful representations of data so that you can manipulate those representations in new ways, and that you can efficiently build new things from them. Furthermore, that we're building out tools that are actually working with creatives, not kind of trying to replace them. That's the last thing we want to do. That's boring. Um, but actually trying to build tools that extend us and extend our ability to communicate. I think um, we can safely say that there is a bright future in the next decade for uh, generative models in the space of, of art and music generation. So I want to close with that. Um, our project is called Magenta, and um, it's about research in generative models. It's also about engaging with artists and musicians 
about building tools for media creation and about fueling an open source community. So every line of code we write goes up on our GitHub and is available for everyone to use. All of the art and music that get made with our tools belong to you, belong to the world. It's, it's not what we're after. And what we're after is understanding how this works, understanding the role that generative models and machine learning play in the artistic process. Um, finally, I want to I look back, I want to point back to this particular uh, drum machine demo that was based upon machine learning research that we did. Um, it was actually done by someone outside of our group. It was done by uh, uh, a guy named Tiro, who uh, lives in Finland, and on his weekend discovered our project. And he's a JavaScript coder. So we now have a JavaScript library for TensorFlow, which is the backend uh, machine learning that we, uh, tool that we use, and also for Magenta. And he coded this on his own. He didn't even contact us. We found this on Twitter. We found this amazing drum machine built around our technology. He left behind a tutorial uh, uh, in, in JavaScript, allowing you to see the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that generated it. And you know, I think that's really exciting to see the community coming along and taking the machine learning that we're doing and transforming it. And I think that's the um, one of the last thoughts I leave you with is that um, in thinking about this space, always think about the role of technology in uh, in art. Like art has always been reliant upon technology, from oil paints to the film camera, uh, in music to the electric guitar. And there's always been this kind of split between the engineer and the artist. And I, what the way I like to think about it is, in general, the engineer makes and the artist breaks. Like the artist kind of uses this technology in a way that she sees fit, not in the way that the engineer saw fit. I, I would point out that um, drum, uh, that uh, uh, electric guitars were uh, designed to be loud acoustic guitars, and that the the beautiful music that we've seen made over the last fifty years with distortion and tube amps and all this noise and all these experiments in musical timbre actually came from misusing the technology. It was not, you know, no one follows the rule book. So. I love it that this guy came along as a, as, a, as a coder, a very creative coder, and he decided how he wanted to use our models, and, and in many ways has used them in ways we didn't intend at all. And so um, with that, I'll leave you with a call to action. If you find this interesting, please have a look at g.co slash magenta. Um, there's a link there um, to our blog, and importantly, to all of the demos that were made, not just by us, but by other people in the community. There's also a link to our GitHub for those of you that like to code. And um, I guess, you know, thank you for your attention. I hope that this um, brought some thoughts to, it, to your mind about how AI and machine learning might fit into the creative process. And at best, it changes your mind and you're excited about what we're doing. And at worst, you found it to be uh, an amusing detour before the break. Again, thank you very much.